course you're feeling these things. You're not a screw up. You're not weak. You're not handling it terribly because you're having these thoughts. And yeah. what I would say to people is a really manageable step is- It's not the amount of time, it's the quality of the time and the presence of your quality of time. I th that I find, which is most powerful, at least in my relationship, yeah. where I may only have a, a half hour to an hour of time a day, certain days, maybe right now, but I, my phone is not anywhere near me. I am looking in her eyes the whole time. I'm engaged, yeah. asking questions. How's your mom? How's your family? How's this? Yeah. Tell me, what can I do for you? Can we play a game right now? Can we do something fun? Can we dance a little? It's the, the presence to the quality of time. And I'm sure the more time you have better, but it's got to be quality time from my personal experience. Are you finding that that's what, uh, I guess women and men want as well when you're coaching people? Oh, these issues go both ways. Yeah. You know, men, men can have the same insecurities as, as yeah. women can in these situations. And it, it comes down to which partner might feel busier, which one has got more to do right now. It could be like, if you're, it's a tough situation. If one person in a relationship right now and they're living under the same roof, feels like they've got tons to do and tons of purpose and tons, of, you know, like I can lose myself in my mission and what I'm doing right now and their partner and is- And be fine. And your partner has lost the job or lost this or- Right. Or I haven't figured out what my thing is yet. I don't know what, you know, you have your mission. I don't know what, like what I'm what supposed to- What do I do? To, I'm, I'm waiting for you to come home every day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm sitting here picking random hobbies out of thin air because I feel like everyone keeps <laughs> telling me now's the time to learn a hobby. So I'm like, should I learn guitar? Should I right. Guitar? Or, <laughs> or worse, I'm on social media watching everyone else's perfect relationship and everyone else thriving and I feel less than. Yeah, exactly. And that, by the way, that's really, we've got to be really careful of that right now. We're used to, we're used to comparing ourselves to others on social media through the lens of, you know, we're seeing their highlight reel of their, um, of their life, you know, oh, they're traveling now. Look at them sipping, sipping a beach on the cocktail. Look at them doing this skydive. Look at, we're, we're seeing the highlight reel of their life. I think now we're seeing the highlight reel of people's emotions. Mm. So in quarantine, people don't have that life, right? We've not got all of these activities that we could be doing, but we're all of a sudden, seeing that moment where someone's just finished their yoga workout and they post and they're like, you know, I'm, you know, I got this quarantine, just did my yoga, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And you're On like, the day. exactly. But yeah, exactly. But you're not seeing like Matthew Hussey in the moment where he's like <laughs> super grumpy yeah. and like irritable and just like today is not, this is not my day and I'm not feeling it today. And I don't want to make a video today. And, and I've made a point of, of saying things like that out loud because I, I think it's important that people get the full spectrum of what other people are going through. Because guess what? Other people are going to dark places. Mm -hmm. Other people are having their freakouts. Other people are having those moments of depression or deep melancholy. They're emotionally hurt yeah. and they're needing that kind of quick connection again they're needing they might go back to the person because they're feeling weak and they miss that feeling of connection or love or intimacy yeah but they know it's not the right fit for them long term they know but this is in a heightened state of vulnerability for them that they go back quicker what advice do you have to someone like that so very much. hard very hard i have so much firstly a breakup even under normal circumstances is <sighs> a tremendously difficult thing what true true i shouldn't say a breakup because there are many joyous breakups we go through but a truly when you experience true heartbreak it is one of the most devastating feelings in the devastating. world devastating you're a zombie <laughs> you're, a zombie. you're dead you're dead inside it's and and it's worse than you're dead inside. It, you act dead to everybody else inside. You, you feel like you're dying yeah, that's, that's <laughs> on, true. on loop, loop all day. You can't get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in a breakup, and this is as true now, now is no different. People need, to, people need to recognize that now is just a difficult breakup on steroids, right? If you're going through heartbreak right now, you're just doing it on steroids, but it's just the same emotions. So don't fret that, oh my God, why did it have to happen now when this was going on? 
that's you're giving it a big story. It's still just the same emotions yeah. of heartbreak. You're just experiencing them in a very in a in a heightened way. And you is- well, and you don't have the ability to rebound physically with that person or a new person, which we could see as a gift. Right. Why uh, is that a gift? Because there are plenty of things, as my brother Stephen Hussey, a wonderful writer for for our website, um, as he says, in a breakup, there are two methods of recovery. There's the athlete recovery method, and there's the hangover recovery method. You're going to like this, Lewis. Tell me. I love it. You haven't heard it before, but you're going to love it because it's (laughs) the analogy is perfect for you. I love it. Um, The hangover recovery method, you think about how do people deal with a hangover? They wake up, they eat greasy foods because they're like, oh, I just need something to make me feel better. They watch crap TV. They lay on the sofa. They wake up at 2 p.m. Yeah. Shut all the blinds. Don't let any light in. uh, Eat ice cream. Essentially, they do all of these things that are temporary kind of pleasure and comfort, but ultimately are not nutritional Mm. and are not the things that are needed to get, you know, what's needed massive amounts of hydration, water, go take a walk, (laughs) sunshine, right. Exercise. Um, yeah. Get the metabolism moving again, get that like crap out of your system. Like that's all the stuff that's needed in that moment. Uh, but it's, it can feel harder to do the things that are actually going to get you out of it. Now look at the way an athlete recovers in an injury, right? You know, better than anybody, you, you don't firstly you still train whatever you can train you don't ignore everything simply because your shoulder's injured you do what you can yeah you do some abs you do some legs you do something else right let me keep a hand swimming yeah exactly you eat well you get tons of rest as much rest as you possibly can you do rehab where necessary but you don't do so much that it injures what you're doing yeah you reset your vision you 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 visualize what you want and start mentally rehearsing the reps the the repetition the action steps you you mental rehearse you you know all those things right so now if you apply that to a breakup the hangover recovery method is let's go and sleep with other people quickly just to get my fix, just to Uh feel connected, just to feel like I'm worth something, just to feel like I'm still sexy. Let me uh, go out and drink, party. Let me eat ice cream, bad food. Keep going to the fridge. Get on Tinder and all the apps. Right, or not, or just hide away under the covers. Uh Don't engage life. Don't, it could be either or, but they're all hangover recovery methods because they don't make you feel better long term they're just short term pleasure the athlete recovery method in a breakup is you do the same as an athlete you say okay my heart might be injured right now right my heart's offline so to speak but i still have everything else so let me make sure the rest of my life is firing on all cylinders right mm-hmm. now let me do everything let me be kind to myself let's maybe like put dating aside for the moment or put that but let me go and make platonic connections. Let me go and build my relationships with my friends and family. Let me eat well. Let me sleep well. Let me train. Let me go and do all of these things that, that train every other muscle in my life so that when my heart comes back online, every other part of me is ready to go. So you've got one problem right now. You're, you're in pain, right? But if that pain causes you to let every other part of your life go down, spiral, now you've got six problems. So <laughs> that, right. that's the part we want to avoid. And Only have one problem, not six. <laughs> right. and, and, you know, look, it's, all of this is easy to say. And when you're heartbroken, you just feel like you feel so bad and so sick in your stomach and so nauseated all the time that you, even hearing this sounds like a lot of work. And yeah. what I would say to people as a really manageable step is I – you know, there's that quote, emotions are weather, let them, let them come and go, right? And that's true. Emotions are weather. I used to think that emotions were really important. A friend of mine, Jameson Jordan, who you know, who shoots my videos, he would always tell me whenever I would be in a real funk, a bad place, whatever, he, I would talk to him about it. He was one of the closest people to me. And I always remember he used to say to me, like, I just think you, like, think your emotions are more important than I feel like mine are. <laughs> mm. ah, you put more emphasis on it. Yeah, you, you like think they're really important. Uh, you you, he was, you he think was, your emotions are you. 
Yeah, he would be like, you, you just seem to f- like give more weight to your feelings than I do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, at the time, I didn't quite hear that. And uh, over time, I've come to understand what that means. And of course, a lot of this is taught in mindfulness training, meditation and so on. But that idea that just because you have a thought, just because you have an emotion, it doesn't make it important. And in a heartbreak, just because you miss your partner, that doesn't actually make that feeling that important. Just because you feel hurt and you feel like, oh my God, I'll never find anyone like that again. That's just a thought and an emotion that's attached to that thought. And it doesn't make it that important. And so when I was going through terrible times, when I've gone through heartbreak, one of the key lessons I learned was, okay, there's really cloudy skies right now. That's the weather, right? And it feels like that weather will never pass. But what I would begin to pay attention to is I would realize that I would realize, oh, for the last 20 minutes, I didn't think about my breakup. Mm. Huh? Small wins. I'd be like, yeah. And and often you only notice it after the fact, because when you're in it, you're just, it could be that you're in a flow state with your work and that's taken you out of it. It could be that you're having a funny moment with a friend. It could be that you lost yourself in a movie. Uh, it could be you just mm-hmm. had a conversation with your brother, your mother, whoever. A workout, yeah. For a few minutes. Could, even if it's just five. For five minutes, you noticed, I felt better. Mm-hmm. I felt, and maybe I didn't feel amazing. But I just, for five minutes, I didn't feel like I was dying. I didn't feel suffering. <laughs> and, and when that happens, here's what I would say to myself. I'd be like, well, that's interesting. Notice those things as interesting. And this, this applies not just to heartbreak, but to depression, to anxiety, to all sorts of different emotions that are undesirable. When you notice that for five minutes of your day, you didn't feel that thing. Because what hap- here's what happens. We have our, like, whatever is our home, whether it's depression, heartbreak, anxiety, sadness, we have our home that we're, we go to. Yeah. 90% of our day. And when we feel that we focus on it so intensely that it becomes very difficult to get out of it because we are focused on that 90% the whole time. And what we don't acknowledge is this interesting window in the day where we didn't feel that. And that window has some clues, has some, Mm -hmm. there's some truth often in that window, that 5% of the day where you felt all right. There's some truth there that's waiting to be discovered, enlarged, uh, held under a microscope. And what I would do is when I would feel better for five minutes, I'd go, well, okay, so what did that, if nothing else, what did that prove? It proved that it's possible for me to feel better. I had a reference point for the fact that I could feel better. And then you go, well, if I felt better for five minutes, if I even felt better for a minute, let's make more of those. What, mm-hmm. how did, what was happening? How did I do it? I might not be able to get my day to the point where I even feel good for a quarter of the day right now, right? That might be an unrealistic goal. But if I had one good minute or one good hour, let me make the new goal, not to be great or to be happy or to get over this, just make more of those. Yeah. And multiply those moments, multiply those minutes yes. into five and 10 and 20 Which minutes. It's a manageable task. Suddenly yes. getting over your heartbreak. You need to get over it, dude. You know, blah, blah, blah. It's not, this isn't, that's not practical advice for someone who's going through hell. But for someone who realizes that, that just for five minutes, the clouds parted and they go, oh my God. Uh, it's like, the, it's, like one, it's like one of my favorite movies, Swingers, where a Mikey is always thinking about his ex and who who he left and then now she won't come back to him six months yeah. ago or whatever and he's constantly talking about it obsessing about it suffering in pain and then he finally learns to just put his attention somewhere else that's right for a few minutes and then put it for an hour and then he goes on a date with someone and then Right. he forgot he thought about her for a day and he was like wow can you i didn't talk about her all today you know and, and it's like, his was so important about that because there's a that what's really interesting about that movie is he, he begins to do these things that slowly start to create more moments of good weather in mm-hmm. his day he goes salsa but, dancing he does this he does activities yeah right but what we have to be aware of you have to respect whatever is the drug 
whether it's your ex, whether it's genuinely a drug or booze, or whether it's uh, a situation that makes you feel bad or whatever, often when we start to create more good weather, we start to take for granted that the bad weather can't appear now. It's like, mm. oh, I'm, <sighs> I'm past it. Yeah, no, it could come back. A storm could come raging through again. You, someone, your, your ex could text you. And if you text back and start engaging, mm -hmm. knowing, knowing what happens that you're, when you start in a conversation with that person, again, you're going to spiral. You're not respecting the drug. You got, you might've been clean for months or years, <laughs> but you got to respect the drug because it's, oh, what man. you don't is when you when you get cocky and you don't remember that there are rituals and routines and practices daily that got you to this good state you are liable to fall back into that trap because you're because you're blind don't yes. be blind don't be afraid it's not about fit you're not fearful you're not worried because you know if I, got, if I didn't die at the height of my breakup's pain, if I didn't die on day two, I'm not going to die on day 22 right. or day 52 or day 1002. If I could deal with this at the height of its pain, I'm not going to die now. So I'm not going to be afraid of this, but I'm also going to respect it mm -hmm. and know that there are certain things that make me feel better in my day and I have to consciously put them into my day because the moment I take for granted that I just feel better, that's when that thing starts creeping. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm laughing so hard because we, <laughs> we have a mutual friend that we've been helping. I won't say his name, but we've been helping navigate certain things in their, you know, their relationship. And, uh, you know, it just reminded me of that, of replying to people when they text you, when you think you're good, Hey, yep. don't go back into that. Make sure you stay true to what you want, what you're committed to by in the athlete mindset of envisioning something that you want yep. for your future and envisioning the right relationship or the better match or, you know, how you want to be feeling and all those things. Right. And um, by the way, and just yeah. remember, and this is true, not just for people going through heartbreak right now, but people going through solitude right now, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who right now are just in solitude. They're not necessarily heartbroken, but they are, experiencing a deep kind of existential loneliness and when we're on our own for long periods of time many people not everyone but many people and perhaps even most have more of a tendency to go to dark places with their thoughts yeah and there's a lot of people that are there that are listening to us right now that certainly can't that you know the i you know some people might be in a hell with someone in the house but these people in solitude are looking at that guy and I'll take that right now over the hell I'm in of being constantly on my own and going out mm -hmm. of my mind. Um, I would say to people that, you know, the same weather rule applies that, you know, you might feel really kind of dark and lonely at points in your day, but there are other points in your day where you don't notice the good weather and pay attention to the good weather and what made you feel good. Did you just have a conversation with one of your siblings? Did you have a little group chat with a bunch of friends? Did you watch a life affirming movie? Did you read a book that made you feel connected to an mm -hmm. author from some period in time? Maybe who was also alone and writing about it. And by reading that author, you go, Oh my God, I feel, you know, someone else is having the same experience as me. I think that's really important is if you're in solitude right now on your own, you, you connect to other people who have experienced yes. that because some of the greatest figures of all time have spent inordinate amounts of time alone, have experienced the darkness that you're experiencing and you're in good company. You, you may feel you're alone and oh man, you've, we have this solipsistic yeah. attitude that we're the only one who's alone. We know it's not rationally true. We know it's not logically true, but we feel it on an emotional level. Those are moments where you have to remind yourself, I'm in good company, not just today, but throughout time. Mm -hmm. Key figures, brilliant people, people that are far more brilliant than yes. people will ever be, have experienced the deepest, darkest existential loneliness and it, in a way, there's a, there is something slightly romantic about yeah. that. I always love when I read an author and I'm, I, I hear that author who's brilliant and who I love. And I, you know, I was just reading Bertrand Russell and, you, and then you hear about something that someone suffers with or something that they've gone through and you go, oh, thank God. <laughs> this person that I love also, you know, suffered. Grew yeah. up, also, right. did this, you know, there's, 
there's that element of it that's really, really mm. powerful. And so I, I think that you, you can adopt, yes, accept that it's difficult. It is difficult. Don't look at, don't look at other people and think they're handling it so well. It is right. difficult. I, right. I'd call my dad at times when business was hard and business was messy and like chaotic and I'd screwed up or I'd lost money or I'd done something. I'd call my dad and I'd be like, you know, my dad's one of my big mentors and I'd call him and say, dad, like, I'm just so stressed. I'm so overwhelmed. This is happening. This is going wrong. I got 10 people asking me for this. Whatever. And he'd say, Matt, part of, the, you, part of the problem is you don't think that other people's businesses are just as messy. You, you're, it's almost like you think that you're struggling with all these things and other people aren't. He said, Matt, I've been in business for, you know, 40 years. Business is messy. That is the nature of it. It is messy. It is chaotic. There are always things going <clears throat> wrong as well as things going right. It, right. That's the nature. That's how it is supposed to be. And mm -hmm. when, I, when he would say that to me, I would, it, it didn't take my problems away. But what it made me realize is, oh, it's all right. Mm -hmm. It's not, this is normal. I'm on top of my problems. I'm beating myself up and taking it personally that I'm doing a horrible job. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like your dad and Jameson are saying the same thing. Your, your feelings are more important. Your mess is more important. It's yeah. A don't give it so much power and B yeah. and, and don't give your feelings and emotions so much power. Not every emotion is a cue to do something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, at the same time, accept that this is your, your view that, you know, in the road less traveled M Scott Peck talked about, I think one of the first line of his book is life is hard. And one of the things that makes life more difficult for us is that we expect it to be easy. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, that's true of relationships. It's true of business. It's true of everything. And when we have someone close to us who says, you're all right, you're, oh, you're at home on your own right now. And it, and you feel like it's dark and lonely and you're having these kind of existential thoughts and you're welcome. That's normal. That's, of course you do. You're living at home on your own in isolation right now. Of course you're feeling these things. You're not a screw up. You're not weak. You're not handling it terribly because you're having these thoughts. That is absolutely normal. And that's what makes it heroic mm. is that you're having all these thoughts and you're having all these feeling, feelings, but you're in the company of wonderful people throughout history who have experienced this, who have had just a bad, just as bad a time, who were dealing with it no better than you. You know, I feel like a lot of people that I've known in the past have entered a relationship through a sexual connection, a sexual chemistry, erotic experiences, mm -hmm. fun times, things like that. And then they start dating and then they start entering a relationship based on that foundation as opposed to based on what do you see for your life you know what are the values the background the culture the religion the money all these different things do you want kids do you not want kids and i feel like that ends up being a, a struggle for a lot of people myself included in my past until i started i tried something differently you um, first had the sex and then you met the person <laughs> exactly yeah and and created this a story about who the person would be right mm -hmm. without actually communicating in a and giving space and time to experience who the person was, right? And same for them with me. Why do you think most people start things that way, you know, in general, as opposed to, hey, let's give it time. Let's ask deeper, more intimate questions like you have in your game. Let's get to know each other. Why do you think that is? First of all, that only began to happen with the democratization of contraception. Mm. This is before the 68, this was not possible. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's very recent, right? you know, that we start making love first and then we find out each other's names. Well, is, that, is, that, is that true all over the world or is that more in the U.S.? Or is it's that true more? wherever people can experience, you know, premarital sex, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Um, in the past, you first had to marry in order to, to be able to have sex. Right. And when I say in the past, it's in the past here. And that's when I was a teenager. And, um, and in much of the world, it still is the case. Mm -hmm. So we are part of a very sexualized society in which sexual freedom and sexual expression has become a part of our values, mm. right? Sexuality That's used so to true. be a part of our biology, and now it's and a part of our condition. Now it's a part of our identity. 
And so we have changed the meaning of sex in, a, in the culture at large, and then we have changed it in our relationships. And so we start from a place of attraction. You know, am I drawn to you? Am I attracted to you? Am I, you know, it's the first thing I think when I, I swipe. What do mm -hmm. I do? I look at, you know, where do I get a little frisson, you know? <laughs> who, do, who, who catches my attention? Mm -hmm. And it's purely physical, you know? So it is a, it is a recent development. It's for most of the people here, this is not their grandparents' story. So this is right. still in the family. It's not like you have to go in the history books. Sure. How do you feel like people could set up for a healthier relationship as opposed to, uh, what would you recommend or suggest them for people? in order to have a healthier foundation. Seeing that it seems so sexualized now, everything seems so like physical, swiping, looking at someone's sexual identity, attraction, as opposed to, I guess, true intimacy and connection. How would you set up a relationship now? There's so many um, different pieces to this. I think the first thing, look, I, I am right about sexuality. I'm, the, I'm not going to minimize it, but I do understand that, you know, it's very important it's a beautiful thing to have a powerful erotic connection with someone, but don't confuse the metaphors. You can have a beautiful erotic connection with someone, and that does not necessarily translate into a life experience. Right, a life story. A yeah. life story. That said, um, the next thing that changed culturally, if you want to really take uh -huh. on the big myths, it's the notion that we are looking for the one and only. Mm -hmm. The one and only um, my my soulmate is my everything. Yes, my everything. Your soulmate used to be God, mm -hmm. not a person. Mm -hmm. You know, the one and only was the divine. And with this one and only today, I want to experience wholeness and ecstasy and meaning and transcendence. And I'm going to wait ten more years. We are waiting ten years longer to settle with someone, to make a commitment to someone. For those of us who choose a someone, and. If I'm going to wait longer and if I'm looking around and if I'm choosing among a thousand people at my fingertips, you bet that the one who's going to capture my attention is going to make me delete my apps better be the one and only. Mm. So in a, in a period of proliferation of choices, we at the same time have an ascension of expectations about a romantic relationship that is unprecedented. We have never expected so much of our romantic relationships as we do today in the West. It seems like a lot of pressure. It's an enormous amount of pressure. We crumble under the weight of these expectations <laughs> because a community cannot become a tribe of two. Mm -hmm. This is a party of two. And with you and me together, we are going to create best friends, romantic partners, lovers, confidants, parents, intellectual eagles, business partners, business yeah, partners yeah. career coaches, <laughs> I mean, you name it. And I'm like, seriously? One person for everything, one person instead of a whole village. Mm -hmm. So that's the first myth. And the notion of unconditional love that accompanies this is that when I have that one and only, I have what you call clarity, but mm -hmm. translated into certainty, uh -huh. peace, <laughs> uh -huh. and freedom, uh -huh. you know, or safety, yes. which is the other side of the same thing. So that's, that to me is if you want to set yourself up, really, the idea that you're going to find one person for everything is a myth. Mm -hmm. Keep a community around you. Absolutely. Keep a, 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 a set of deep friendships, really deep friendships, deep intimacies with, part, with friends, with mentors, with family members, with colleagues, you know, that. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing for me in having good relationships is, is um, diversify. It's about like, relationships, yes, but yes. not sexually. Yeah. No, no. Right. For some people, it will include that. For the vast majority, it won't. But the notion that there isn't a one person for everything, and that that doesn't mean that there is a problem in your relationship when that happens. Mm -hmm. The second thing is stop constantly looking at people as a product, where you evaluate them. And you evaluate yourself. You know, in our market economy, everything has become a product. We include it. And so love seems to have become the moment that the evaluation of the product stops. You have finally been approved mm. when you have been chosen and when you choose. 
This is Eva Illouz, a sociologist who writes about this very beautifully. It's like love finally becomes the moment, the moment you can experience peace. You're no longer looking, selling yourself, proving yourself, trying to capture somebody's attention. It's exhausting. And once you are in that mentality, you also are continuously looking for the best product. You never say, you know, how can I meet a person who... People don't often talk about how can I be a person who... That's so true. Okay? So it's what you're looking for mm -hmm. in the market economy of romantic love rather than who are you? How do you show up? What do you bring? What responsibility do you take? How generous are you? Etc. Absolutely. Second thing for what I think sets you up for a better relationship. And the third thing is understand some of the things that are really important to you and don't get involved with someone on the hope that some things will change. Mm. Do things ever change with a partner that yes. you want to change? Yes, things do change a lot. I mean, lot in, many different things can occur in a relationship, but it's different from I'm coming in here <laughs> <laughs> right. to, to turn things around, you know, because so much of us wants the experience of acceptance. So... Absolutely. With acceptance, I would say this. Another thing to prepare yourself. Um, you can love a person wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Without having to love all of them. What do you mean by that? It means that the notion of unconditional love is a myth. Adult love lives in the realm of ambivalence which means that relational ambivalence is part and parcel of all our relationships. We have it with our parents, our siblings, mm -hmm. our friends, which means that we continuously have to integrate contradictory feelings and thoughts between love and hate, between excitement and fear, between envy and contempt, mm -hmm. between boredom and aliveness. It's you continuously negotiate these contradictions. That ambivalence and living with that ambivalence is actually a sign of maturity mm -hmm. rather than continuously then evaluating. See, in the beginning, you evaluate, is this the right one? Is this the one and only? Is this the... Then it becomes, shall I stay or shall I go? How right. do I know I have found the one? Is the pre marital or the pre-commitment relationship and then afterwards it becomes is it good enough mm. we continuously continue with the evaluations right is it good enough or how happy am i am i happy enough so that's the unconditional love no we live with ambivalence in our relationship there are periods where we think what would life be like elsewhere mm. and then we come back and then we say i can't imagine it without it this is what i've chosen i'm good here but it's a conversation the idea that you will be accepted unconditionally is a dream we have for our parents when we are babies. It's not part of adult love. Right. So is unconditional love is not something that we can expect. Unconditional from a love is a myth. Mm -hmm. So the one and only is a myth. You, yeah. you asked me how do we set ourselves up for the best for relationships yeah. up front. There is no one and only. Mm. There is one person that you choose at a certain moment in time, and with that person you try to create the most beautiful relationship you can. But you could have done it with others. Mm -hmm. it's, timing is involved. Lots of things are involved. So there is no one and only. There's no soulmate. Soulmate is God. Mm -hmm. You can think that you have a soulmate connection with someone, that you have a deep, deep meeting of the minds, of the souls, of the heart, of the bodies. But it's a metaphor. It's not a person. It's the quality of an experience that feels like soulmate. Mm -hmm. That's number two. Number three, there is no unconditional love. We live with ambivalence in our deepest love relationships. There are things we like and things we don't. And things they like about us and things they don't. And moments they can't, exp they can't be without us and moments where they wish on occasion they could be away from us. <laughs> right. And that's normal. Mm -hmm. Number four, the happiness mandate, M continuously evaluating how happy I am. You know, how, if you continuously pursue happiness, you're miserable a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. What should we pursue instead? We pursue integrity, depth, joy, aliveness, connection, growth, 
those things that ultimately make us say, I feel good, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about this, but I don't pursue happiness. Uh-huh. Happiness is the, con- the consequence of a lot of things you put in. You pursue caring for someone, having their back, feeling they have your back, wanting the best for them, what the Pali people call compersion. You know, those things you can pursue. Compersion? And What's compersion? Compersion is feeling joy for the happiness of the other person. Is this is polyamory relationships? It's a concept where it's like that they're is... with a, another yes, sexual partner. But I think the word is bigger than just, uh, you know, contained within the poly community and culture. It is uh, the notion that you want good for the other person, yes. even when it doesn't have to do with you. Right. You're proud of them. You admire them. You, you enjoy their, their mm-hmm. growth, their successes, you know. What about when... Um Someone says, you know, I'm with this person, they make me happy. What does that happen when you're looking for someone to make you happy in the relationship? Well, the day they don't, you will say they make me unhappy mm. or they don't make me happy, but it's they, they do to me. I'm the recipient of what they do. They have the power. Ah. They can give, they can withhold. I depend, I crave, I long, I yearn, I respond to them. What, and what should we be thinking of instead of this person makes me happy? How, mm-hmm. should we, how should we approach that? We give each other a good foundation from which we can each launch into our respective worlds. Ooh, that's cool. A home is a foundation with wings. Uh-huh. Or I like to think a good a, a relationship is a foundation with wings. I think people have to look at sex not just from the, stand, from the perspective of pleasure, but from the perspective of bonding. Mm. I believe it is an opportunity for two people to grow closer together. And when two people know how to truly satisfy each other, it creates an amazing bond. Deeper connection. Better balance. Exactly. More attraction. Yes. All and it of it. Keeps it going. Exactly. Because if you have two unsatisfied people sexually, you're gonna have a problem. You can't find a relationship where that exists and they're all happy and everything's great. It doesn't work that way. People crave intimacy. People crave that level of bonding with each other. And yes, biologically speaking, we can talk about the needs of a man and a woman and all these things, but I think even going deeper spiritually and all that. Sex is important, and we are not taking enough of a mature approach to understanding and learning sex. I think people are very much behind in their understanding of it. Especially in America, it's like we weren't educated. Exactly. It's a very, like, hush-hush type of thing. It's not talked about in schools. Your parents, at least most parents, aren't talking about it Mm -hmm. until it's like, the moment and it's like let me say something to just get it out and then let them figure it out well and, right? and not just that a lot of our parents don't know either right like people just don't take time to get more educated on their bodies on sex on true sexual satisfaction there's a lot of lies going on i tell people all the time listen a lot of women aren't being sexually satisfied all right but they're lying to their friends they're lying to their their partners right. So there's a perception that everything is all good. No, it's not. It, there's a huge disconnect between the reality or the perception of women's sexual satisfaction and the reality of women's sexual satisfaction. And that contributes to a disconnect in marriages. Because again, if the woman is not satisfied, she now becomes less willing to be uh, sexually involved with her husband. Mm. Now, he starts to g- gain resentment. He starts to feel neglected. Starts to wander. Exactly. Every snowballs from there. Mm. We can't overlook that and act like everything's going to be fine. And we can't say, well, you should love them enough to where it doesn't matter. Listen, <laughs> we're talking about maintaining a committed relationship. That's a part of it, mm. plain and simple. And we have to learn how to make it better on both sides and how to be more honest with each other. I think if we can learn to be more honest and transparent, then we can work on the things that are lacking. Wow. But people, again, they feel very uncomfortable speaking about sex, speaking about their needs, and and constructively criticizing their partners. We have to learn how to do Because you don't want to hurt someone, that. yeah. So exactly. How, how often should we be talking about our sexual needs in, a, in, a, in an intimate relationship? Should it be like once a month we sit down and like schedule it out? <laughs> is it like pillow talk every week? Like what should be, again, everyone's different, but what do you think is an appropriate amount of time? Yeah, I, I think it depends. I, so what jumps in my head, I would say every three months, if I had to put a number on uh-huh. it, all right? But I do think it depends on the couple. I think more so it's when an issue arises, 
talk about it. There you go. The key is we have to create environments where we can have those talks. See, again, we're, we're laying the wrong foundations in our relationships to where we can't have these open discussions about sex and other things lacking in our relationship. And we're afraid to push our partners away. We're afraid to ruffle the feathers or rock the boat. But if you can't talk to them... We resent things, right? Exactly. And what happens is you hold it in, and now the, the negative energy comes out in other ways. And now they're confused because they're like, why are they giving me this attitude? And they're thinking, like I said earlier, he's thinking it's about the towel. No, it's not about the towel. <laughs> it's really about something else that you're not telling him. So we need to be more honest and transparent, and we need to create an environment where we can have this talk, and you're not going to take it personally to the where you're going to internalize it or allow it to now throw our relationship off because you're getting upset and you're allowing it to, you know, have a negative impact. No, take it as, okay, that's how you feel. Cool. Let's work on this. Mm. How can we make this better? You know, we have to be serious about tending to the needs of our partner if we're going to have successful relationships. Yeah. There's so many uh, divorces happening. You know, it's higher than ever, right? Yeah. I think it's the... We had a divorce attorney on who's talking about how it's higher than ever. And there's also even more people who stay married who probably should be divorced, mm -hmm. who aren't happy. And so it sounds like there's a very small percentage of married people who've been together for many years who are actually still thriving in relationship. I'm just, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe yeah. there's more, but it sounds <laughs> like it, right? Uh huh. There's a very small percentage that are having like these incredible long-lasting marriages and relationships that like mm -hmm. have the attraction and connection and balance and all these things. Why do you think that is and how can we decrease the number of failed relationships or is that the wrong question to ask? No, I think it's a good question. I think, well, one, we have to understand marriage is not the issue. It's marrying the wrong person and marrying for the wrong reasons, mm. all right? And then underlying to those things <clears throat> are, is the lack of healing. Because it's the lack of healing that leads us into these uh, wrong relationships and allows us to entertain situations we should not entertain. Mm. Because again, for example, if if you're a guy or a woman, if you've been through some things and now you think you don't deserve that great person, that great relationship, because your perception of yourself is low, now you're going to just latch on to whoever comes around who says, I want to be with you and willing to give you what you want at that moment. Yeah. And you're thinking, okay, this is safe. This will work. Let me go ahead and go with it, but you're never truly into them like that. It's never going to be the relationship it needs to be, all right? But that all stemmed from your lack of self-worth because you didn't heal from whatever traumatized you emotionally before. So how do we heal first? What's that process look like? So it's a long process, and I do plan <laughs> on, I have a book I'm working on right now called Finding Love After Heartbreak, Ooh. and it's going to lay out the entire process. But So I'll give a little bit right now, yeah. and I'll save the rest for later. Great. So one thing is first, we gotta get the hurt out. And so I have this exercise I do at all my events called the Who Hurt Me list. Mm. And so you get a piece of paper. It could be like a hundred people me. like, oh, <laughs> motherfucker. It happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ask yourself the question, who hurt me? And now every person who comes to mind, write them on that paper. Doesn't matter if you think you move past it. Doesn't matter if you think it's small and insignificant. If they came to mind when you asked yourself that question, Put them on the Anyone paper. in your life. Anyone from a in your child, life. a friend, to your parents, to a, a lover. Anyone. Yeah. Anyone, anything, if they come to mind, put them on that list. Because that's how we start to recognize the pain points in your life. Now we see, okay, this is where it's coming from. A lot of people have suppressed what has happened to them. And so you can't you can't address and resolve something that you're not willing to accept exists in your life. And the reality is that just because it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it's still lingering within you and it's causing a lot of problems and it causes a lot of emotional stress, which then turns into physical ailments and it just snowballs Tension, from there. Tension, anxiety, yeah. and it's all fear, of that. All yeah, these depression. Yeah. All right. A lot of these things that we go through in, in mental health stem from things that we have not resolved from our past. All right. And it's just all contributing to the, the issues that we're ex experiencing mm -hmm. in the now. Right. And some of us, we may not be experiencing the issues right now, but we will. It's coming. <laughs> it's just festering in you, and it's going to come out at some point. Yeah. So write so, a list and and think about those moments and reflect on them? Or what's well, no. So at, at that <clears throat> point, once you get the list, now we can uh, see the first person. And, and I won't go too much further, but let's just say you're going to have to go through a process of getting things off your chest. We have not released these things from our spirit, from our system, and we need to essentially emotionally detox. And to do that, you've got to get it out. 
So whether you speaking to a recorder, write a letter, something, and like, like I said, scream into a pillow, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, but I, but I do want like a full release. I'll, again, we don't fully release. Would right? you release each person or just everyone at one time? So I would say this: you want to start with let's say your top three. Now I've had clients yeah, yeah. where they did their top three, and that kind of once they got through those. They were able to process everyone differently to where it wasn't necessary to do everyone else. All right. Now, right. if you have 10 significant experiences and 10 significant different people that need to be addressed, yes, you may have to release with 10 different people. So it depends on the person. And that's why something like this requires a more in-depth process. We got to talk about things. We got to understand yeah. what about it did you internalize, how you're seeing it, because some of it is changing your mindset, changing your perception of what happened understanding that it wasn't about you. Like we said earlier, hurt people hurt people. And so once you understand that and understand how they behave and why they behave the way they do, it changes how you look at things mm. and how you internalize those situations. So there's so much more we got to get right. into, but <clears throat> just getting at least that list started. Is a good well, step. At yes, because now you at least get to see, okay, here's where it is. Here's what needs to be addressed. Now let me get help <clears throat> to address these things and start the process of healing so that gotcha. I'm not ending up in more bad situations or bad relationships. Repeating the process. Exactly. <clears throat> Let's say you've dealt with the hurt and it takes, you know, it takes the time that it takes you and you've gone through all that. How do you manifest and attract a partner that you want to be with that has those three keys, the, the connection, the attraction, and the balance that you feel like is the one, could be one of the ones, mm -hmm. How do you set yourself up to attract that incredible partner? So one, you got to be yourself. So finding yourself is number one. Mm. All right, you can't connect with someone if they're connecting with the fake you. Ooh. All right, yeah. that's a false connection. So you have to discover who you are, become confident in that, stand strong in it. Now, who is drawn to that person? You know it's real. All right, and so that's where we begin. Two, you need to exude positive energy all right to me and this is I, I think this is very important for women all right because the reality is that it's men or the type of men that a lot of women want aren't going to be drawn to a negative woman no there's millions of good women but that doesn't mean they're positive women all right and it's that lack of positive energy that holds them back more than they realize really yes and just like even just saying negative things throughout the day they, they might be a good person but if they're always complaining or ex negative exactly or, and not even just what they say again it's how they're coming off the because facial energy, energy their body language yes it's like so look at it like this I, I tell people all the time it's not what you say it's how you make them feel mm -hmm. all right so you can say all the wonderful things you want but if in your presence they don't yeah. feel at ease, they don't feel peace, they don't feel that positivity, that's still going to throw everything off. If you say nice things but you have a frown, <laughs> exactly. it's like, what's the point? Exactly. You know what I mean? yeah. exactly. And what, what a lot of women aren't realizing is that their energy is off because they have walls up. Mm. They're so scared, they're so uh, fixated on protecting themselves. Because of they've been hurt in the past. Exactly, haven't healed from those things, but mm. I tell people all the time, the same walls you have up to protect you are the same walls blocking your blessings, all right? So you don't realize you're restricting your ability to love and be loved wow. yeah. because you're walking in fear, all right? You can't walk in fear and expect all these wonderful things to happen. It doesn't work that way. Even in business, the ones who succeed are the ones who put the fear aside and say, I'm going to have faith and push forward no matter what, no matter how it looks in front of me, no matter how many people tell me you're doing the wrong thing, get a regular job, whatever. No, you believe what you need to do and you push forward past that fear. It's the same thing with relationships. You have to push forward in faith, not fear, if you want to receive that great relationship. Mm. And so, yes, this can happen with men as well. I don't want men thinking they can carry around a bunch of negative energy and they're going to get a great relationship. But I do think it shoots women in the foot more because here's the other thing that people don't talk about a lot. And some people may not like this, but I'm just going to keep it yeah, real. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It pulls women away from their feminine energy. And when they're woman, not positive. When they're not positive. And when they're holding on to these fears and have these walls up. And it's the feminine energy that makes the woman so powerful. That is what, that's the tool that is at her disposal that mm -hmm. can make the world her oyster, all right? But women have become very detached from their femininity. And the thing is this, if you, 
A lot of women will say they're not feminine. They were, they're just not that way. I dispute that in most situations. No, you become detached from it. You become uncomfortable with it due to, again, a lack of healing and due to experiences in your life. Now, if you are more masculine, so to speak, and you are happy that way, then by all means, continue to live your life as you are. But if you're not seeing things work for the, the way that you want them to, and you're in that energy, that more masculine energy or more further away from your feminine, then consider making a switch. Consider mm -hmm. at least trying it. Yeah. See the difference. And what I find with a lot of women is that not only is it beneficial to them as far as uh, relationships wise, it's beneficial in the quality of their life. Or their health. Their health, their peace, their work, you name it. I have a client, she's a, a, a doctor at a big hospital. And when she came to me, she was frustrated with relationships, ready to give up on men. Nobody liked her at work. She was just a hard, tough manager. So we worked on her energy. We worked on healing. We got her energy. We got her to embrace more feminine energy. She will t swear by it right now. In one month, her whole hospital started to love her. Wow. Now they're all helpful, whether they were women or men. Men started coming out the woodworks, all right? <laughs> hey, let me get your number, girl. Let me yes. get at you, girl. Yeah. She ended up meeting her soon-to-be fiancé on an airplane mm. two months after we started doing the coaching. So, What were the shifts that she made every single day? Like, what was the things that she said, okay, I'm going to not be this way, I'm going to start trying this? It was just, it was one, being more conscious of your energy. I think, number one, we have to be mindful of the energy we're giving off. We become so distracted by our issues that we're facing in the world, by our responsibilities. We're not always in tune with what we're giving off. So, to give an example, and this is just a small one, even for me as a man, I work out a lot. When I come out the gym, I started to notice I'm very tense. Mm -hmm. My face is, oh, you know, yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I've learned to, when I walk out the gym, take a deep breath, relax the body, relax the muscles, and the energy completely changes, all right? Because yes, you can become very intimidating as a man, just like you can become very intimidating as a mm -hmm. woman. And so you have to be mindful of, are you making yourself more approachable? Are you allowing the, uh, people to feel more comfortable being around you? And so that starts with being mindful of it, being conscious of it. And one great way to do that is, Get an accountability partner, mm -hmm. all right? Absolutely. Tell someone who, who has the ability to be positive, because you don't want to pick a negative person to be your accountability partner. It's right. going to throw everything <laughs> off. <laughs> but you pick a positive person, and you say, hey, listen, whenever I'm being negative, whenever I'm giving that bad energy, let me know. What is the biggest lesson you learned about marriage and relationships, being in a committed relationship during an extremely adverse time yeah. of the world? What's the biggest lesson for you? How much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> Bro, listen, uh, I, I, I've learned so much, right? But here's the number one thing that I've learned. We have been sold a myth. Ooh, what is that myth? That love heals all. You know, marriage is the answer. Like, if you're not married, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Like, you got to be in a relate. Like, we've been sold a myth. And here's what I mean about the myth. We have held marriage up. Like, it's the top of the mountain. And when you get there, all of your problems are answered and gone. That's not true. It's not true. And that, that I, cause you know, from, from being, you know, from a kid, we're watching movies, we're watching television shows, we're listening to music. It's all about love. It's all about finding it. It's all about getting to that mountain of, oh, when I find the one, then I can relax. No, marriage is like getting to the beginning of the mountain. Oh man, base camp. Base camp, <laughs> and guess where the summit is? <laughs> Between. And guess what? That altitude is steep. It's high. It's hard to breathe up there. It's hard to breathe up there. It's jagged. It's not a smooth, you know, ride. That's what marriage is. And so, you know, understanding, mm. you know, and, be, and coming into the myth of it, it's like, oh, got it. I love my wife. She loves me. The union is great, yet we got work to do. Mm. And, and until we do our work, it, the union itself can't subsidize it. And so that myth that marriage mm -hmm. is the answer was one of the myths that I, you know, came completely uh, directly had to confront. Yeah. And what I realized. When did you confront it? At what, what you know year what? in the marriage? 
or what day? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what it was is that it was gradual. Mm-hmm. You know, it was gradual for me. You know, and part of that gradual revelation was looking for the marriage to bring me a certain level of fulfillment that I was not actually pursuing on my own. So, so don't get me wrong. Yes, marriage is great. Love is great. It can be fulfilling. However, if we are not actually doing our work and finding out what makes us happy, what makes us fulfilled, and we're relying on the union to do that, we, we, mm-hmm. we ultimately find ourselves becoming manipulators. To get what we want. To get what we want. Mm. We're trying to like, Because we oh, expect that that person or the ex- relationship is supposed to provide us something. Exactly. What because is the relationship spo- supposed to provide us? Here's what I believe a, a great relationship provides, right? One, first and foremost, um, you know, let's look at it for a minute like a business, yeah. right? So, if you, you know, if you, have a, if you have a business and you have a partner, uh, what, what makes a great partnership? When both bring something to it, mm. right? Because you have a partner. Yeah, if your partner is just taking everything and not adding value to the business, you're like, why is this person making money? There you go. Why am I paying back there you into go. this person? There you go. Yeah. So when you look at it that way, you know, a, the purpose of a relationship mm. is both people making a contribution so that that contribution enriches the lives mm. of both, right? So I'm bringing something, you're bringing something. Now we both, you know, our, our happiness, our joy is enhanced. It's not created. This is very important. The myth is that the marriage will create your happiness. It's not true. It can enhance it if you already have it. Mm-hmm. So if you have a partnership, both people are bringing their, their, their contributions. And then as a result, your business thrives because you have two people who are committed. Here's the second part, both going in the same direction. Mm-hmm. Right. Is that, so is that related to values then, or is that related it's related to, to values? It's related to um, uh, um, purpose. You know, um, I, I, I had a um, one of my uh, friends. You know, we were talking, and um, they kind of gave me this uh, visual, right? And so I think this is, and it was very helpful when it came to like marriage and relationships and how to think of them. So they were like, "All right." So I want you to look forward, like do do a visualization Mm -hmm. and I want you to look forward. And when you look forward, I want you to see God. I said, okay. (laughs) And they said, now start walking to God. I said, great, I'm walking to God. Now they said, now your partner is right next to you, right? So hold their hand, great. We am holding their hand and now we're both walking to God. It's beautiful. Now, Turn to your partner and then they turn to you and now try to walk to God. It's challenging. Exactly. Yeah, sidestep it over there, you know? Exactly. You're like a crab or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Precisely. So when you talk about the, you know, what is the purpose of a union? Mm-hmm. The purpose of a union is that when you have your right purpose partner and that person is committed to you and you're committed to, to them and you both are heading in the same direction, you both can walk together. Right, right. But when you're trying to get somebody, you know, to a direction that they, they otherwise may not want to go. Oh, they're turning the opposite way. They're turning the opposite way. Or they're trying to get you where you may not want to go. Mm. You can't get there from there. Mm-hmm. So I believe that the purpose of a relationship is one, you know, making a contribution to each other's happiness, you know, having that partnership. Not and making the other person happy. You cannot do it. And I talk about this. to the other person's I, happiness. Yeah. This is why I wrote the book. You, you can, this is another myth. We, this idea, how many times have you seen it in movies? How many times have you heard people say it? Oh, this person makes me happy. Mm-hmm. Oh, they make me so happy. It sounds so good to say. But what happens when you say someone makes you happy? It means you are outsourcing your happiness to that person. Ooh. Yeah. Because that same person that makes you happy can then make you mad. Okay, so then tell me who's in control of how you feel? The other person. Exactly. So why don't you're victim to their there you go their 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 way of being whatever they're doing their way of being their mood I don't but here's the reality no matter how much somebody loves you they, they don't they, there's it's impossible for someone outside of us 
to contribute to our happiness in, in a perfect way 24 seven. So is love enough? No, no. Is love enough? No. <laughs> you can love somebody and not stand them. Right. Right? I love my wife. My wife loves me. We still have to do our work and make the commitment to walk this thing out. Mm. Right? Like, we still have to communicate. We still have to understand, like, oh, okay, that's your issue or that's my issue. Right? Like, so love is great. But love is not enough. Mm. And that's the myth. People think yeah. like, oh, if love I is fall, all you need. That's all that's right. It's all I need is love. No. <laughs> you it makes me feel good when I hear that. <laughs> right. But it's not all you need. No, you need compatibility. Mm. You need compatibility. I need compatibility. Like when you have compatibility, when again you talk about people going in the same direction, it's like, okay, cool. We're committed to going in the same direction. We're committed to the same type of life. We're committed to allowing each other to be mm -hmm. our, the full uh, self that we were created to be. That to me, in, 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 in addition to love, is what can make a great marriage yes. or make a great relationship. But love alone, it's not enough. You, yeah. There's a lot of people you love you can't stand. Right. There's a lot of people you love that you broke up with. Right. Because you say, you know, I love them, but we're just not compatible. Mm -hmm. And that love may never go away. Mm -hmm. But so often we're romanticizing love in a way that it produces so much pain in those who don't have it. As a movie producer yeah. that produces a lot of movies around faith and love and community and connection, I'm sure there are some lines in your movies that you produce. You didn't write the scripts. No, I didn't write. You produce the scripts. <laughs> you produce right. the movies that have lines like this that mm -hmm. maybe uh, remind people of this way of living. Mm -hmm. like, you make me happy, or whatever the line is. Right? I'm sure there's somewhere in one of your movies. <laughs> as someone who's uh, producing certain movies for entertainment, like yeah. knowing that sometimes maybe there's a line in here and there that. Mm, that's not really true for you or where you're at in relationships. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that? I'm not yeah. saying it's right or wrong, but just how do yeah. you navigate that as a human, yeah. knowing that's coming out in, well, that, in that, some of the entertainment? Right, in the movies that I do, I always try to put in truth. Yeah. So, so yes. this point of view is something, you know, uh, the movie that comes to mind uh, that I worked on when I was an executive was Jumping the Broom. And that was a romantic comedy, mm -hmm. you know, an upper class family, working class family, you know, get uh, their the, the the son from the working class family marries the the woman, the daughter from the upper class mm -hmm. family in a, in a weekend wedding in Martha's Vineyard. And Laz Alonzo and Paula Patton, you know, were in that film. And my wife, Megan, uh, was one of the uh, stars of that film. Mm -hmm. And we started dating at the premiere, uh -huh. I mean, you know, from the premiere uh, about That's nine cool. months after production, which was very cool. And in that movie, you know, we intentionally put, I worked on that to make sure we put real truth on the difficulty, right? Of like, yeah, you can, two people can love each other, but then what do you do with their families? Ooh. How do you navigate conflict? How do you navigate an overbearing mother? How do you navigate, you know, parents who have a certain image for what they wanted for their daughter and who the, their daughter's marrying doesn't align with the image? And so that movie has a lot of truth in it. And ultimately, you know, we didn't cut corners at all, and that's why the movie was so successful. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting ready to do another romantic comedy, and we're putting more truth in. So for me, I'm always mindful and cognizant right. of how I feel and think about love, and I try to represent that when I'm doing movies that are uh, on that subject. Because yeah. I'm not trying to sell a fantasy, sure, right? Sure. I want to sell the reality, and that yes, you can win, and yes, when you find that partner that you fall in love with, but there's you gonna are be challenges. Committed, but there's going to be challenges. <laughs> And maybe more challenges of the different classes or different backgrounds Absolutely. or cultures. Absolutely. I'm a big believer, whether this is true or not, that we we talk about, we write, we podcast on the things that we become experts on the things that we need the most. <laughs> yes. So at the School of Greatness, I talk about all subjects. So it means I'm flawed in pretty much every area of life. Uh, I don't believe and it. And I'm but constantly I hear you. looking for more wisdom to improve, right? Yeah. Uh, where do you feel like in the relationship side of things that you, I think I asked you this question last time, a couple years ago, where do you feel like you still need the most improvement in, in relationships for you? Yeah, um, so I need the most improvement in a number of areas. <laughs> <laughs> How long do we have? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let's, Let's just be honest, honest. Paper. okay? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> hey, hey, I have not perfected this thing and I'm working on it every day and anybody that tells you they perfected it, they're gonna lie about everything else. Right. Um, so the, the first area that I'm working on, and, and you may relate to this yeah. because of the work that you do, 
you know, my father passed away when I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. You know, he passed away of a heart attack uh, when he was 36. And that was a very traumatic, you know, experience uh, for me and my brothers. Um, and so my older brother's three and a half years older, my younger brother's three and a half years younger. Mm -hmm. And so coming out of that, you know, no money, my mother didn't have money for therapy or anything like that. And so, you know, we were in church and we watched movies, yeah. right? And so, and then also I was very active in school. And what I began to see is like, oh, okay, if I perform or achieve at a certain level, people would say, oh, Devon, good job, mm -hmm. right? Pat me on the back, right? So I said, oh, got it. So the more that I serve at church or the more I achieve at school or the more that I, you know, do my chores at home, the more approval I would get. Yeah. So what I began to do was I began to seek that out. Mm -hmm. And I began to become really good at meeting everybody else's need. Ooh. And so that yeah. persona, right, of yeah. like, oh, you need something done, give it to Devon, yeah, yeah. right? It's like, oh yeah, I'm your guy, I can do it, da da da, right? Because I was finding my value in all of the achievement mm. and all of the approval that came with it. In, my, in middle school, people started calling me Mr. Perfect, you know? And, and at first I was like, oh, this is great, I love that. Oh, wow, Mr. Perfect, right? But then as I got older, it became a trap. Mm. Why? Because I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. But I had this image that I had to live up to. I had this expectation of myself that, oh, I've got to do everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. Right? So getting to your question. That's a lot of pressure. Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? It's exhausting. It's exhausting. Right. That's why I talk about it in the book. I had to kill Mr. Perfect. I said, yeah. I, gotta, I gotta let go of this persona because you know, I'm not that and I need to be who I really am. And so when you talk about what the area I need to improve on, so you know, bringing that into marriage, right? Like, hey, I'm here to serve and I'm here to be the best husband I can be and I'm here to give and I'm here to sacrifice. All that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But when it There's, crosses boundaries. But here's the boundary though. Yeah. The problem is that no matter how altruistic you or I may wanna be mm -hmm. in our relationships, with our women, if we do not first acknowledge that we have needs, right. our altruism is flawed. Mm, how so? Because we are serving in order to fill the hole mm. in our to soul. Get approval, to, to get approval. To get approval. To, to, there not, you go. To get pat on the back. There you go. Yeah. You know, and then also it's like, oh, well, no, I don't have any needs. No, I'm here to meet your need. No, you're human. I'm human. I got needs. I think I can relate to this big time for most of my life until mm. up until recently, mm. I would do things in order to receive love in relationships. Yeah. And I would not do things, um, if someone got upset at me, I would not do those things anymore to just try to make them happy so they would continue to love me. Whew. Even when it would cross my boundaries or when I didn't agree with something, I would do it to make the other person like me, love me, make, you know, be happy with me. And then I found myself resenting myself the yeah. longer that would go on because I was doing things that I didn't believe in or didn't agree yeah. with or there was a boundary of mine or was crossing my my line to serve someone else. Yeah. And I think it's it's learning that balance probably or like navigating and, and learning how to communicate expectations, which is a lot about in your book, which I love. Yeah. The whole book's about setting clear expectations. <laughs> right. And not going into a relationship with the viewpoint of, well, this is the way a relationship is supposed to look mm -hmm. based on society. Mm -hmm. Like just thinking that the other person knows what you think and they know, and you know what they think and having that is not gonna work. It ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna and work. And after nine years, not to put your marriage on the spot or anything, but after nine years, how important is still communicating expectations nine years into marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's the it's every day, right? Really? Oh, oh, it, you can't autopilot this thing. You can't say this is what I no. expect one day and then it'd be good for the rest of life? N never, <laughs> it will not work. It won't work and here's why, you know, I go back to that, the, the, our flaws, right? We're, we're all flawed. Yeah. All of us, and all of us have traumas and tragedies and things that we have experienced in our life that we have compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. And that's why I go back to this earlier thought of like, you know, the myth that marriage is, is, is gonna, you know, it's, it's gonna save you no. and it's everything. The reason why I think that's a myth is because the more you are with somebody and the more that you love them and they love you, 
Yeah. The more that, those flaws, <laughs> fears come out. The fears more. come out. The Why trauma because of vulnerability, mm. and you're actually sharing your life with someone, and you're allowing someone to see who you are. And there's also certain things you don't know that you've gone through that have impacted you to the level that they have. It's coming up now. Exactly. And so in a great relationship, it serves as a great mirror. Mm. So when you talk about setting expectations, you know, nine years in, it doesn't stop because all of us are changing. And also to that point, you, you, we have to learn to communicate. We have to yeah. get our words out. We have to say, okay, you know, hey, babe, can I expect this? Can you expect that? Let's get to the middle so that we understand, oh, okay, cool, here's what I can hold you accountable for. Here's what you can hold me accountable for, instead of assuming. And that assumption, hmm. it, again, no, no matter how much they love you, no matter how long you've been together, no one can read our minds. No one. No one, no one. And so when you start behaving, and then here's what happens. Dude, you, 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 we have these unspoken expectations. Mm -hmm. Unspoken expectations are relationship killers. You have this unspoken expectation. You treat the person as if you have spoken it and they know it. Yeah, and you fault them for it. And then you them, yeah. judge them. You judge them Man. when they don't meet the expectation they may not have been aware of, and then you make a false assumption about mm -hmm. their intent yeah. for you. They don't care about me, they don't there you me, go. they don't think about me. There you go. And, and, and They're then, selfish, whatever. There, there yeah. you go. And so in our head, we become the judge and jury over somebody. Without even telling them. Without even telling them. <laughs> what they were supposed to do. Exactly. Yeah. And giving them the opportunity to say yes or no. That's it. That's it. Because too often in relationships, we're trying to control. And so just because you have an expectation, it does not mean that person is obligated to meet it. Right. That person has to agree. Right. That person that you're with is free. <laughs> the same way you're free. Okay. And if they want to meet that expectation, great. And if they don't, then you can talk about what that means. Right. Hey, okay, you know, I have a certain expectation. Okay, that's not something you want to meet. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about if we are compatible. Let's talk about if we are going in the same direction. Right. Very important. Instead, we suppress. We f allow these feelings to fester. We get mad. We we then Make get wrong. bitter. Yeah. You know, and then we, you know, someone asks us a question, we turn a cold shoulder. You know, it's like, well, why? Because we haven't actually communicated. We haven't actually asked the question, hey, can I expect this from you? Is this okay? Is this all right? Is it not? Is it cool? Yeah. Right? And so that's why, you know, in the book, I spend so much time talking about communicating expectations, learning to set expectations. Just because they know, just because they love you doesn't mean they know. And 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 I have seen so many relationships go by the wayside because there was this idea, this myth that, oh, just because they love me, they're supposed to know what I want. No. They don't know. Everybody has a different upbringing. Exactly. They were exposed to love and marriage in different ways. And so what may look like love to somebody may look like death to somebody exactly. else. So you gotta communicate and find the, the, the happy medium of what, you, what works for your relationship. How do we learn to love ourselves so much that it doesn't matter what our partner does or doesn't do? Oh man, Lord have mercy. Like, is there a way where you can fall in love with yourself without a sense of ego yes. and like, I'm, I'm God, but yes. love yourself so much that it doesn't matter if your partner meets your expectations, communicated or uncommunicated, whether they're supporting you in the way that you want or not, whether they're proud of you or not, is there a way that we could do that? Or should we be expecting something out of our relationship in return, you know, either way. Bro, listen, <laughs> listen, man. Um, you know, listen, I, 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 my, my views on this may be a little contrarian, so I'm just gonna Let's speak my Let's truth, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of, so I'll answer the love question in a minute of self, but I wanna mm -hmm. hit the piece that you mm -hmm. just hit, which is the expectation, right? Yes. I personally believe that if you give to get in a relationship, yeah. you are on thin ice and the sun is coming out. Mm -hmm. Because, <laughs> no, <I'm not> <laughs> right, right, right. Because again, what happens is you're not free. Mm -hmm. You're not free. You're, you're not actually giving from your heart because that's what you want to do. Mm. You're giving from manipulation. 
To get something in return. Because to get something in return. Yeah. So you're treating that relationship like the stock market, mm. right? Well, yeah, if I give a certain amount of money to a certain stock or portfolio, I can expect a certain return. Yeah, hopefully it goes up. Right, hopefully it goes up, right? But that's the dynamic, mm -hmm. you know? But relationship is not, it's not stocks, man. That's somebody's heart, that's somebody's life. Whew. And so to, when you're investing in someone with the hope that they'll do something for you, you you're, you're messed up. What if that person never contributes in the way you contribute, let's say, after years? Is okay. it is it the right relationship still? Okay, this is Should great. you let go of the expectation? Well, I don't need that in return. Great, so so here, here's how I think you answer it, and I wanna hit the love part yes. too. So, so I believe everyone should give freely mm -hmm. from how they feel and want to feel, and they give to that person because that's what's in their heart to do. Over time, it's not an indictment on that person if that person isn't giving as much. It just may be a revelatory about compatibility, mm. right? It's like, oh, okay, got it. You know, the person that's giving, right? Mm. I'm in a relationship, you're in a relationship because you have needs, you want those needs to be met. Oh, okay, I'm seeing there's an imbalance, mm -hmm. right? Like I feel great about everything I'm giving, but I also recognize that there's some needs that are not being met, right. and maybe there's some compatibility issues we need to talk about. Or you can communicate about it and see if- That's you, right, yeah. that's exactly right. Like, hey, you know, look, I, I have needs, I, I'm in a relationship because I want people to contribute to these needs. Like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be fine no matter what, but I'm in this relationship because I actually love the idea of someone else, you know, contributing to my well being. Mm -hmm. So you have to assess it right. and see if there's compatibility mm -hmm. and alignment, not point the finger. Because so often we're so ready to point the finger. Oh, this person's not giving as much as me. Oh, it's like, no, no, no. If life is a mirror, mm. what is the mirror reflecting? What is a relationship reflecting? And oftentimes in my experience, relationships are the greatest teachers greatest. of who we are. Greatest. <laughs> right? <laughs> who we are and who we aren't, okay? Like, like, and, and, and too often, people run from difficult relationships. Yeah. I believe that you should, whatever the lesson is you gotta get about you, before you break up. Heal it within the relationship there you go. first. There you go. Because then you take that healing to the next relationship. Yes. You know, we all have sexual desire, we have physical desires, and often we're attracted to people, for, and, and there's a, a sexual component, but the character of that person doesn't mesh with us, right? Yes. And so the, the physical stuff doesn't last that long. It can't go on forever, although it can go on fairly well if, if, if you connect on that level. But it kind of dies down at some point, and then you're confronted with their psychology, their personality, their character. You have to be able, you have to think, can I talk to this person in five years and carry on an interesting conversation? Can I sit across from the table? If that is, if you want a long-term relationship mm -hmm. and, you know, find a stimulating conversation with them, you know, because that's, that's really what it ends up boiling down to. And so you, you really want to be able to also judge their character. And if you're able to look mm -hmm. inside the other person a little bit and to see a kind of deeper connection between you, I believe that, that the sexual part, which is extremely important in any relationship, will actually be intensified and heightened, right? As opposed to the immediate kind of animal attraction mm -hmm. that we have to people. So if you deepen your connection to that person and love is involved, where you actually feel a vulnerability to them in this kind of back and forth electrical charge, I think the physical component, you know, the, the value of it increases. Right. So that's the number one mistake people make, you know. Um, is, it, at, is it, do people have sex too early? Well, I don't know what's going on necessarily with young people right now. I know the hookup culture is still pretty strong and, you know, guys are watching a lot of porn. Yes. And so, you know, that's probably a tendency. And in the traditional and things have changed, it was the woman who had more to lose by becoming pregnant who tried to keep the sex at bay for at least several weeks or months or, or longer. And that's kind of been lost. But yeah, I think um, the fact that the, the falling in love process generally takes time, right? I mean, that we do have love at first sight and it is a real phenomenon and, I, and I've had it myself. Really? Yeah. But, um, the idea, so 
There's a, a famous French writer named Stendhal who wrote a, a great book called On Love, one of the greatest books written about love. It was in the 19, early 19th century. And he compared to falling in love to what he called crystallization. And it's based on this thing where you would throw a, a piece of wood into this mine in, in Germany somewhere at Salzburg, and then you would pull it out like a week later and it would be filled with all of these brilliant crystals. And he compared that to the process of falling in love. Mm. The person is just who they are. They're like a, a, a trunk of a tree. But your mind kind of puts all these qualities on them, crystallizes them into some kind of ideal figure, right? And so that mental mm. process takes time, right? It requires also some distance and some fantasizing. You know, sort of basic elements of human psychology. So if what do you mean by distance? Well, like don't spend all your time with the person in the first yeah, month. Yeah, and, if, and if, if you're having sex right away, it, it's too close, it's too intimate, it's too, it's too early to be able to have, go through that process, right? Mm -hmm. And often, you know, there's usually a letdown after, the, after that initial sexual encounter, if you have it too early, right? Whereas opposed to letting time go by and letting the other person begin to think about you and fantasize about you and in their mind sort of imagine some interesting qualities about you and, mm. and fascinate them, which is what he calls this crystallization process. I mean, literally think of it that way, that you're, you're having a, you're, you're in, in their mind, they're kind of forming this sort of ideal crystal um, image of you, right? And it takes time and it takes some absence. It takes the ability to say, you know, you're not in their face all the time. You, you disappear for a couple of days, a couple of weeks or whatever, not a weeks, but a few days. And you let them think about you and you let that kind of spell. Because seduction and love is kind of a spell that you're casting, right? And there's an art to it. And so the mistake people have is they, they're in too much of a hurry, right? Too much of a hurry to want to have sex, to fall in love, to... Yeah, or to have like a, a really you know, intimate relationship or, or to get married or whatever it is. In general, in our culture, people are too much of a hurry. They're too much of a hurry to get, make money, too much of a hurry to get attention. And it also involves, you know, in, in romantic relationships. Right. Right. So what's so, the difference between seduction and love? Well, I maintain that the process of seducing is making the other person fall in love, right? The process of seducing is getting the other person to fall in love. Huh. Could you, um, could, you could, someone, yeah. could someone fall in love without being seduced? Without seducing no. them? No. Even in love at first sight, there could be like a moment of seduction that turns into that, or how does that work? Well, even in love at first sight, which I say I've kind of mm -hmm. maybe experienced, it doesn't necessarily lead to something, right? right. You still have to go through a process mm -hmm. where the other person's character that you start um, idealizing and romanticizing and thinking about them, you know, even, even that immediate attraction, there is still the seduction process that has to go on. Sure, sure. Right? And so, you know, I try in the art of seduction, I make the point that political seduction, marketing seduction, social seductions, because in your office you're continually seducing, it's the same process. And it's getting, your, getting the other person to think about you and getting them to fall in love with your product, with mm. your idea, with your political platform or whatever it is. And that process of internalizing that other person, of having their presence, their, their, their spirit or whatever inside you, inhabit you, mm. and, the, and you're thinking about them a lot, is a process of falling in love, mm. right? So it doesn't mean that there aren't seductions where you're seducing the other person and then it's over after a month, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to lead to a relationship. Mm -hmm. But I don't, so I, I separate seduction from just having sex. Yes. So if you go to a bar and you, you pick up a woman in the bar and that night you go back to your place and you have sex, that's not seduction, right? Because we are psychological creatures, right? We're not, we're not animals and the process of actually having mm -hmm. our emotions engaged by the other person is takes a lot deeper process, right? It can't happen quickly, it can't happen overnight. So seduction isn't like, you know, pickup artists 
don't really like the art of seduction so much. Why is that? Because it's not quick enough for them. Mm. I'm telling you, you have to go through these steps. I don't want to have to go through all these steps. I don't have to wait three weeks to sleep with her or a month. I don't have to surprise her and give her gifts. Or I'm talking about from the male point of view. Sure. Do all of these things that Robert talks about. You know, I want a quick, you know. Some of them aren't like that, but some of them are. And so there are plenty of books written out there about how to pick up women or guys in a bar. But the seduction isn't about that. It's something else. It's something more elemental. And I talk in The Art of Seduction about how it goes back to our childhood, how we are incredibly vulnerable to the emotions of other people. It begins with our parents, right? And the sense of, you know, we internalize their presence. We're thinking about them. We have this kind of very deep emotional attachment to them. We're seduced by our parents in some ways. It kind of sets a tone from early childhood, this need to feel vulnerable to other people, right? Mm. Um, this, that's the thing as well is, yeah. um, you know, it's a lot of people mistake seduction, and that's the re reason I wrote the book. They have really bad ideas about it. What do they think it is? Well, they, they have an idea that it's this kind of cold process. Typically, it'll be a male seducer, but it can be a woman, and they're really conniving, and they're coming up with all kinds of tricks. And schemes. And, schemes. Yeah to get the woman or man to like fall for them. And either they're after money or sex or something else, right? And actually seduction is a matter of vulnerability. It's hmm. making yourself vulnerable to the other person. Really? Yeah. Um, and you know, we live in, in times where people have a hard time being vulnerable. You know, if you're insecure, if you're filled with a lot of anxiety, you tend to close up inside of yourself. And to let another person in and to let them have some control over your emotions can be kind of a scary process. But if you can't feel that vulnerability, if you can't open yourself up to the power of that other person, there won't be a seduction. It'll be this kind of cold, mechanical process, right? So how do we learn to open ourselves up and be vulnerable to allow for seduction to happen? If so, we're really interested in someone, we're like, oh, we're really... We want to start dating this person. We're really excited about the potential, but we're also don't want to ruin it and mess up. Yeah. Well, um, it you know each relationship is different. Right? Yeah. You know, I, I I talk to a lot of people uh, on this vulnerability issue, particularly women who've come to me for for counseling. Mm -hmm. They've had a bad experience, right? They dealt with maybe a man who was a kind of cold, calculating seducer type or an abusive relationship, right? And um, what happens is they get kind of bitter and hardened by it, and they don't want to open themselves up to, to another relationship. They don't, they're not aware of that's happening, but under unconsciously that's what's going on. And I try to tell them, mm. if you let that happen, that means that that person, that abuser or whoever it was, they've defeated you, not only you know physically, but mentally. They have conquered you, they have ruined one of the most important aspects of your life. They've made it impossible for you to feel vulnerable and open because you can't trust another person. Wow. And it's very difficult. So I, my process in there is telling them that, get, making it clear to them that if that happens, then they have, they have this power over you and you don't want to let them have that power, right? And so we work on ways, first making it clear how important it is in life to feel vulnerable not just to other people, but to everything in the world. That's sort of the subject of my next book. But to feel vulnerable when you read a book, to open yourself to other people's ideas, to open yourself in general to people and to their spirit, and to let them in, and to let them have some influence over you and some power over you. You know Why is that important? Because it allows you then to have a deeper understanding and a deeper connection with people. So, you know, we all kind of live in these castles mm -hmm. where we're trying to protect ourselves, right? And we're all kind of defensive. Because, and it's for good reason. We live in a world that's very harsh. You know, a lot of information, a lot of things going on at the same time. So we kind of live in these castles. And you're, you're not understanding people unless you can kind of open up to their spirit. I talk about in the uh, Art of Seduction, Enter the other person's spirit is one of the key chapters where you're able to kind of put yourself inside of the other person. 
and feel what they might be thinking, right? Which is, I think, a problem that a lot of men have in, in dealing with women that they're, try, that they're interested mm. in. Putting yourself in their position, trying to understand what makes them tick, what their psychology is about. To do that, you have to kind of let go of yourself. You have to be willing to kind of float and let yourself go into them right. and open yourself up to their spirit and not assume that you know everything about them or that everything, all of your ideas are correct. So vulnerability is a very important element that we must have in this world in order to be able to have empathy and to be able to understand people. Is it, you know, you wrote a book about the laws of power, the 48 laws of power. Is this, you know, different than the laws of power, the, the you know, the seduction strategies where you're being more vulnerable as opposed to, you know, well, believe it or not, um, the, I wrote The Art of Seduction as a kind of, not a sequel, but it kind of played off the 48 Laws. Okay. And there were a few chapters in the 48 Laws that dealt with seduction, uh -huh. such as use absence to create honor and respect, you know, or make others come to you, mm -hmm. or create compelling spectacles. There were at least eight or ten of the 48 Laws that were very sort of seduction-oriented. And the idea is, hmm. we all want power in this world, I maintain. That's sort of my key thesis that drives all of my books. And the, I, it's not power just in a political sense. It's the idea that you have some control over your fate, control over destiny, right? And control and the ability to influence the people around you. Well, seduction is the ultimate form of that kind of power. Really? That's what I, yeah, so I talk about that in the 48 mm -hmm. Laws. It's a form of soft power. So people, if you seduce them, they're not even aware that you have gained this kind of power over them. They've opened up to your influence. It's kind of hypnotizing in a sense, right? It's like this, yeah. you're not even aware. Yeah. Just being hypnotized by someone's message or their, their brand or their product or their political uh, message as well, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. You're just like, I like this. I don't even know why I like this person. Right. Interesting. Yeah, because if people sense that you're trying to get power over them, if they sense that you're scheming, that you've read Robert's 48 Laws of Power or whatever, they get defensive and they close themselves off to you and, they, and you can't move them, you can't get the, maneuver them in the right way. I know um, about 16 years ago when the pickup artist thing was really big and hot. With the game and yeah, The game and everything. Yeah. Neil's a friend of mine, he's a great guy. Great guy. But, um, you know... Every woman in Los Angeles, where I live, <laughs> had been approached by a pickup artist. Right. They all knew the strategies, the negging, all that kind of, you know. the little, Putting them down and this, yeah. Yeah. They knew all of it. And so they, it didn't work anymore. It lost, it lost all its power because everyone had been exposed to it, right? They could see through the tricks. They could see a pickup artist coming from a mile away, you know. All the little gag, little tricks like mm -hmm. cards or reading their palm or yes. all this stuff. Oh, come on, man. I know you've read that book. So yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. So if people sense that you're trying to manipulate them, they close off. And that's why in advertising and marketing, they know that they have to make it seem like they're not advertising. That it's just kind of word of mouth. That's just the average person on the street who's touting their products, etc. Because if you're advertising, it's so clearly how you're manipulating, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So the trick in seduction is to have such a gentle touch that people don't even understand what's going on. And that's what a kind of a master seducer can do. You know? And what I'm hearing you say, that's, that's living from more of a vulnerable state. Is that right? Being open to um, being vulnerable or? Well, you know, there are people who are cold seducers and they seduce women, but I don't, you know, there's kind of a limit to it as yes. well. It's not the kind that I'm interested in. Gotcha. So I've known a lot of really great seducers. There was a person in Paris who was sort of the, to me, the, the, the greatest seducer I ever personally met. He was this Brazilian guy in Paris, huh. very tall, very handsome guy. But he was the most brilliant seducer I've ever seen, right? And I've known others as well. What, what did he do? Well, it, I say it was this kind of openness that he had, um, you know, and, and you could call it a vulnerability. 
There's a kind of a childish, boyish quality. So the women felt comfortable in his presence. He might, you know, dump them in a week and go after someone else. But in that week, he was completely at their feet. He, he you know, he was inside their brain. He understood them deeply. And he was like a boy, you know, who didn't seem threatening at all, right? And I know probably the greatest male seducer who ever lived is probably Errol Flynn, the great American, Irish American actor. I think he's Irish, actually. And Errol Flynn supposedly had slept with, I don't know, like 3,000 women. That's and crazy. he died at the age of 51. I remember when I wrote <sighs> The Art of Seduction, I was kind of doing the math. That's crazy. And it was like Wilt Chamberlain or something like that. It had to be like a woman every other day or something. That's right? crazy. And then... I wanted to understand what made him so powerful, right? Because he was one of the icons in the, in, in the art of seduction. And finally, I found a book written by a woman, an actress who'd been seduced by him. And she kind of revealed to it all of his secrets. And the key was, he made women feel so relaxed, right? She said, just being next to him was like drinking two martinis. I felt so calm and so relaxed. He had this kind of animal presence where he was very comfortable with himself. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing about that Brazilian man. He wasn't defensive at all. He was very, very comfortable with himself. He wasn't arrogant or grandiose, but he just felt comfortable in his own body and his physicality and in who he was. And I think the problem that a lot of people have is they bring their insecurities into the seduction realm. And it's very anti-seductive it kind of breaks the spell because when you're insecure and you're trying to to pick up on a man or a woman the other person can sense it right you're not saying anything but they read it in your body language because we're animals that read a lot from nonverbal communication mm -hmm. and when another person is insecure like that it means they're thinking about themselves right and it's a very off-putting sense. Like they're more worried about if they say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And it makes the other person tense and insecure. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, Lewis, but if you've ever been around a very insecure person, it kind of makes you uncomfortable super and uncomfortable. awkward. Yeah, super uncomfortable. So probably the most important lesson I tell people in, in, in the realm of seduction is to be able to project a degree of confidence and calmness and comfort with yourself are probably the most important quality. When I got married, who did I want my husband to be? This bitter, broken down woman who had been through the ringer in all these years and all these relationships? Or did I want him to meet someone who, because we're, we're always in the process of healing. Mm -hmm. We're always in the process of growth and our emotional health.